Like, I can totally imagine Mark McGrath being like, yup, I'm in your 36-year-old sister-in-law's favorite band. Deal with it, loser. And then peeling out in his Ferrari. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty, and this is the Punk Rock NBA. You know, I've never been in a real band, and I'm kind of glad because, honestly, it seems really annoying. On the one hand, if you keep your style the same on every album, the fans say that you're stagnant and you've run out of ideas and they hate you. And if you do change your style, then they say that you fell off and you should go back to playing the old stuff, and you guessed it, <laughs> they hate you. And the big question to answer here is, why do some bands just completely fall off a cliff when they change their sound, but for other bands, that's the thing that makes them blow up? I'm gonna do my very best to answer that question in this video. But first, I wanna thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. You guys know that I'm a huge believer in self-improvement and self-education and building the skills that you need to bring your ideas to life, and Skillshare is a great way to do exactly that. But what a lot of you may not know is that I have actually worked in online education as my day job for the last seven years, and I sincerely believe in Skillshare. This stuff can and will change your life if you actually put in the work. There's tons of content to explore, real projects to create, and also, very importantly, the support of fellow creatives. And I could go on forever about all the great classes they have, but just a few that I personally suggest are Gary Vaynerchuk's social media class. Honestly, I don't think that I would be here doing what I am now without some of the things that I've learned from him about social media. Also, Rand Fishkin's introduction to SEO. He's kind of like the Tony Hawk of SEO and just generally an incredibly insightful guy. And also Jessica Hish's hand lettering for designers. She's one of the absolute best in the game at hand lettering and I love learning from her. Skillshare is also incredible incredibly affordable. If you get an annual subscription, it actually works out to less than 10 bucks a month. And the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. I don't like change. Have you ever like discovered a new band and you're like, oh, I should listen to their old stuff. And you go back and you're like, what? They used to sound like that? For example, like I mentioned a minute ago, Bring Me the Horizon. I always wonder how many people discovered them in the past couple years because of songs like this. You just can't quit. Why don't you deal with it? And then they either listen to the old stuff or they go see them and they play their deathcore medley. And they're like, why are they making all those weird sounds? And that's the first category of bands that I wanna talk about today. Bands that just did a complete 180 in terms of their style. Maybe the single highest profile example of this that I can think of, and also one of the most dramatic, is the Beastie Boys. As some of you may know, they didn't always sound like this. They actually started out as a hardcore band that was actually pretty sick if you're into that like early 80s like thrash kind of sound. It's super random, but they actually have the earliest recorded example of a blast beat that I can find from 1982 in this song called Riot Fight. which totally blew my mind when I found out about it because I thought of them as just, you know, like stoner bro party rap. Or on the more scene side of things, I guess you could say, Under Oath. Most people know them for their like mid or later career stuff, which sounds like this. And along with the use and from first to last, like I would consider them one of the definitive mall screamo bands. They had the good cop, bad cop vocals, the white belts, the boot cut girl jeans, the whole nine yards. But to me, they will always be this band. the pro-life deathcore band. Now, to be fair to them, they were probably like 16 or 17 when they did that, and I'm 100% certain that they cringe at those lyrics now. And another important part is that for both of them, their first style was never intended to be like the final destination. It was just a stopping point along the way. The Beastie Boys were definitely a good, cool, hardcore band, but I wouldn't say they were anything like super amazing and special, but they would go on to just completely redefine the way we think about sampling on their album, Paul's Boutique. And it would have just been so much wasted potential if they stayed a hardcore band or if Under Oath stayed like the pro-life deathcore band. 
So the big takeaway here for me is that for most creators, your own vision for your work is probably several steps ahead of what your audience is ready for at any given time, which is great because you should be thinking big. But on the other hand, it's also important to keep your ego in check and not stray too far from the path because what you don't want to do is believe your own hype just a little bit too much and end up like all those like 80s hardcore bands that suddenly decided that they should turn into like absolutely awful hard rock bands. <laughs> And next, the polar opposite of a band like Under Oath or the Beastie Boys, someone that I don't think anybody would accuse of being like brilliant creative visionaries, including the guys in the band themselves, Sugar Ray. Every morning there's a halo hanging from the car. You probably know them as one of the corniest bands of all time, the kind of stuff they play in like the men's shoe department of Macy's, or in the bathroom when you go pee in the middle of a movie. But they weren't always that. Their first album was actually pretty good, punky rock stuff. And I'm totally speculating here, but I think based on interviews that I've heard with Mark McGrath, I think that this is an example of a band actually selling out. Like consciously saying, you know what, fuck it. Let's just write some corny shit that your sister-in-law would listen to on the way to meet her friends for happy hour at Applebee's. Let's make some fucking money. Again, I'm speculating here, but just reading between the lines, I get the sense that he does not give a fuck about making any kind of art. And you know what? I can respect that. And I also respect people who do the exact opposite of that and make just like completely unlistenable, difficult, like pure art. Because either way, what I respect is people who do the thing that they set out to do, whether that is to make art or just to make as much money as possible. I respect people who have a goal and just 100% go for it and are completely unapologetic about it. Did you say something? No, I did not say anything. You fucking head. Like, I can totally imagine Mark McGrath being like, yup, I'm in your 36-year-old sister-in-law's favorite band. Deal with it, loser. And then peeling out in his Ferrari. So the takeaway here is don't let anybody else define your goals as a creator. Tweezer, right here. Here. And I don't want to speak for them. This is just my personal opinion, but I think I might put our last night in that bucket too. For those who aren't familiar, they came out back in the late 2000s as a good but mid-tier post-hardcore metalcore kind of band. And they did fine, but they didn't really blow up until I think it was maybe about 2013 or so when they started doing metalcore covers of pop songs. And again, I can't speak for them. These are my words, not theirs, but I'm pretty sure that those covers are not necessarily their favorite thing in the world to do. I think that they recognize they're kind of corny and they're probably a little bit sick of it. But on the other hand, it's obviously working. They've got millions of Spotify listeners, their shows are always sold out, and so they keep doing them. Some people might call that selling out, but I don't know. I just call that smart business. Show me the money! But moving on, not all transitions go as well as they did for the Beastie Boys, Under Oath, or Sugar Ray. I'm especially interested in the category of bands that changed their style, completely alienated the majority of their fan base, and then changed back to their original style. And I think for the most part, pretty much won their fans back. For example, Avenged Sevenfold, who took a lot of heat for going hard rock with Hail to the King. Everyone said it was like a Metallica ripoff, which in hindsight, I really don't think was that different from their other stuff, but whatever, it turned a lot of people off. But then they got Brooks Wackerman on drums. They came back with the stage, which was easily the most progressive stuff ever. And people were cool with them again. Another example of this is Slayer. And in my opinion, Slayer is easily the best thrash band of all time. Yes, even better than Metallica, at least as a thrash band. And hot take here, I think Ditto Head might be the best thrash song ever recorded. And I know a lot of people feel the same way as I do about Slayer's thrash credibility, which is why it did not go over so well when they kind of went new metal all of a sudden. which was kind of a bummer because A, it just like wasn't particularly good new metal and B, it was in like 1998. 
which was several years late to the new metal groove metal kind of explosion. And so it's just kind of weird. And look, I get it. They'd been a band for like 15 years. They wanted to try something new and they eventually kind of came full circle. They started playing thrash again and everyone's like, all right, Slayer's back. The world was restored to balance. But I think it really highlights the tough spot the bands are in. On the one hand, if they had continued to just put out South of Heaven type albums all those years, people would have criticized them for not evolving. And then when they do experiment and try something a little bit more contemporary, they get a bunch of shit for that too. Or maybe my favorite example of Mice and Men. They came out as one of the leaders of the like MySpace crabcore kind of scene back in 2009, I think. And they blew up almost immediately, but they didn't stay that way for long. By their third album, they went just full butt rock. The only criticism I have is I wish they would have just taken it one step further and gone like all in on it. Start wearing affliction jeans, leather wrist cuffs, button down shirts, and growing soul patches. But in all seriousness, I think these were really good songs and it definitely worked as far as getting them to that next level of popularity. They went to, I think, number four on Billboard. They toured with like Linkin Park. They got a ton of radio airplay. They successfully went from being like this scene metalcore band to a rock band, which is hard as shit to do. So I have a lot of respect for that. But I do think it kind of got old after a couple more albums of that stuff, especially when it became clear that Austin Carlisle contributed absolutely nothing to the band musically, and they only kept him around as long as they did because he was the star. Each album was kind of less interesting than the one before, and so it kind of seemed like they had fizzled until they were like, you know what? Fuck this shit. We're a metalcore band again. And they put this out. Welcome back, boys. Are they as big now as they were at the height of their popularity in the Restoring Forest days? No, and they probably never will be. And I think they're okay with that, which I think is super smart on their part. And that's the larger lesson here, I think. For any band or business, there's this constant question of, should we be trying to grow our audience right now or deepen the relationship with the audience that we already have? And it's not an easy question to answer. On the one hand, yes, getting new fans is always great, but if they just bail on you in a month, if they're just Fairweather fans, then that didn't really help you, right? But at the same time, if you want to actually make a living, you do need to grow your fan base at some point, and knowing when to switch from one mode to the other is what makes you successful in the long run. Which makes me think of that whole subset of bands that I talked about at the beginning, the ones that did successfully change their style, but now have to spend the rest of their career getting punished by nerds, telling them to play the old stuff. I think this is especially big on like the metal side of things. For example, Opeth, who started out as, I guess like progressive death metal. But since then have become kind of like 70s prog, like King Crimson or something. And everyone's like, bring back the growls. Or Over, who went from being, I guess, like pretty typical 90s black metal to then ambient kind of stuff to now like 80s new wave. In a hidden corner by the white sea. And of course, Bring Me the Horizon, who have done everything from like deathcore to rock to pop and done it all very well. And again, people are constantly punishing them to play the old stuff and saying that Ollie can't do those vocals anymore when he obviously can. And the common thread with all these bands is that I don't think any of them changed because they wanted to sell out or necessarily even brought in their fan base. Like, I don't think this was some sort of calculated marketing move on their part. I think all of them are just really talented musicians who kind of got bored of playing metal and wanted to do something different. And my favorite category of bands, the ones who went belt rock and didn't change back to their original style. The metalcore graveyard is littered with the corpses of bands that tried to do it, chasing that dragon of Sirius XM octane airplay. And I get it, like it seems like that's gonna be your ticket to the big leagues. This is gonna be the thing that finally takes us to the next level, but more often than not, it actually ends up being a net loss for their career. The Word Alive would be a great example of that. So tell me, was it worth they went from being one of the bigger metalcore bands to one of the smaller bands in the active rock scene. And the vast majority of the time, I would rather be a big fish in a small pond than a small fish in a big pond. My favorite example of this is, you may remember a couple years ago when James Hetfield was like co-signing very hard for this thrash band called Battlecross. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
He would talk about them in interviews, he took pictures with them, they got to open for Metallica at their festival. He did pretty much everything he could to put them on. And even with all of that, it didn't work. And the reason why is because people who go to see Metallica are there to see Metallica, not discover a new band. Dave, how much do you love Metallica? Can a, you uh, a lot, my whole life. And Metallica, how much do you love Dave? Have we, you? Um, we don't know anything about that. And speaking of Parkway Drive, they might be the ultimate example of a band successfully making that transition. If their old stuff was like the Australian As They Lay Dying, Then their newer stuff would be, I don't know, like the Australian Five Finger Death Punch or something. Welcome to a world of pain. It's not really my thing personally, but it's definitely working for them. They went from being a band that would play just like absolutely anywhere, like the floor of some random coffee shop in an out of the way town in Spain, to now just crushing those gigantic European festivals like Vakken, and I'm sure making massive amounts of money, and I totally get why. Their new stuff is like tailor-made for that audience. And I don't know if this was on purpose or just kind of worked out that way. I'd be curious to know, but it's just perfect. It's got that corny kind of vibe with all the big sing-alongs where you can imagine a bunch of drunk Germans putting their arms around each other and singing along in the middle of some muddy field with 80,000 other drunk Germans. And lastly, the artists who have changed so much that they're almost like post-genre at this point. AFI are one of the best examples of this. They've gone from playing like hardcore skate punk kind of stuff in the 90s. Like I saw them with Strife and I think 97 when Davey was in his straight edge phase. To more like horror punk a couple years later to like post hardcore alternative electronic rock goth post punk or whatever the fuck you want to call their later stuff. And again, they did it all very well. I don't personally like them, but there's not a bad album in their catalog. Pretty impressive. Or in the Warp Tour world, Falling in Reverse. They started out more or less picking up where Escape the Fate left off, kind of like slightly metalcore-ish rock, I guess you would call it. But they've evolved a lot since then. Ronnie was one of the first people in the Warp Tour scene to start rapping. And his newer stuff has everything from like electronic stuff to rapping to breakdowns. He pretty much just does whatever the fuck he wants and it works because it's Ronnie. But you know who I think is a really underrated example of this? Maybe the single best, most impressive one, actually? Kid Rock. You can say what you want about him as a person. You can hate his politics all you want. You can definitely hate the way he dresses. But the dude is a fucking musical genius. And I mean that sincerely. He's done everything from like old school party rap back in the early 90s. To like rap rock, new metal kind of stuff. to just like straight up old fashioned rock and roll. It of my first kiss. To 80s electro, like Africa, Bambada kind of stuff. To country. And almost like kind of stoner rock. Like if this was released by some band from Brooklyn with mustaches and Baroness shirts, the kind of people who read Decibel and Brooklyn Vegan would eat this shit up. Now, is he cringe in many, many ways? Yes, absolutely. But you gotta give him some credit. The dude is a fucking freakishly talented musician. And how can you not admire the just massive levels of Chad energy on display during his fur coat era? Get your autograph, no, man. No, no. Oh, man. Yeah, you can, you can. All right, cool. You beat the fuck out of that guy right there. Yeah. All right, my friends, that does it for this video on bands who changed their style and fell off or didn't. Let me know what you think in the comments. What's your favorite example of a band that changed their style? And why do you think it worked or didn't work for them? Before I let you go, I wanted to mention a couple things. Number one, if you haven't checked out the Punk Rock NBA podcast, I would love it if you would do so. Number two, I wanted to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon. It is because of your support that we're able to do the podcast. Because of the patrons, I was able to hire a producer and editor who makes the whole thing happen. She's amazing. And it's because of you guys that I'm able to pay her. So thank you very much for that. If you're interested in supporting us on Patreon, there's a link to that in the description. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time. Time.